Welcome back guys to the latest Tidal Gardens building video. Time flies, man. I just looked and the last time that I did an official building update was way back in January. As always, I wish that there was more done, but then again, there were some major milestones that we accomplished between then and now. Okay, let's get into it. The first major announcement is I got the floors stained and sealed. This was a somewhat unexpected upgrade to the building. Staining and sealing the floor wasn't in the original plan a year ago, but as the project timeline got extended, it gave me a little bit of flexibility to inject some improvements along the way. I decided to pull the trigger on the staining and sealing of the floor because I want to be absolutely sure that I'm happy with the building before the tanks go in. There are just some of these projects that can't be done once there are operational reef aquariums. Spraying horrible concrete products qualifies as one of those things. A second reason I'm glad the floor got finished is it really polished the look of the building. It's always going to look industrial, but the new floor warms the place up visually and it gives it a sense of refinement. The third and final reason is the ceiling did a lot as far as protecting the concrete floor from water spills and also made it a lot easier to clean. Salt water does a ton of damage to concrete and I was told by several people leading up to my decision that some kind of coating would be necessary. As for cleaning, the ceiling helped out immensely. While it was unsealed, the concrete always looked dirty even minutes after I mopped the floor. Also, it would always give off dust over time, making the space even more dirty. Mopping the floor wasn't that easy either because the floor would grab and it took forever to mop up 5,000 square feet. All those issues ended once the floor was sealed. I can easily mop the floor with a 48 inch microfiber broom and also apply a coat of concrete wax to further protect it. The wax coat is taking a bit of a beating now with the carpenter working on the posts and the plumber working on the RO system, but then again, that's kind of what the wax is supposed to do. It takes the hit so that the sealer doesn't have to, and you can add more wax later and then burnish it to get that mirror polished look again. A major worry that I had was that the newly sealed concrete floor would be slippery when wet. I was fully expecting to have to put down some sort of top coat with some kind of grit to it, but it really wasn't necessary. I've walked around with wet shoes, tracked in snow, and honestly, it was never that bad. Moving on to the RO system, the water treatment corner is starting to take shape. As a refresher, the plan for this building is to make as much of our RO water from collected rainwater as possible. The entire roof of the building collects rainwater. All of the downspots go underground to a centrifugal filter that separates out any debris like leaves and other gunk that makes its way down. That water is then collected in a 10,000 gallon cistern underground. Fast forward to today, and we're now taking the water into the building first into a pressure tank to make it easier on the pump that's sitting out in the cistern. From there, we need to disinfect the water. When the water is in the cistern, it's basically a bacteria farm. That bacteria would seriously damage the RO membrane, so we have to sterilize it before it gets there. That gets done in this 120 gallon chlorine contact tank. It gets bleach periodically dosed by this pump depending on the flow going into the tank. While the chlorine does the job killing bacteria, it too must be removed before getting to the RO membrane because chlorine also damages them. That gets handled in this next stage with this activated carbon chamber. The activated carbon soaks up and permanently binds up chlorine as well as a bunch of other things. 
We are almost to the RO system, but we need one last filter before we get there. There are these little critters that live in the water that can survive the chlorine treatment and will make it through that carbon filter. They're about six microns in size. So this filter is a one micron filter that stops all of them, as well as any fine debris coming out of the activated carbon stage. Finally, we get to the RO system itself. This is a commercial 3,000 gallon per day unit. As crazy as it sounds, this unit can be upgraded in the future to something really big if we needed to by adding additional membranes and installing a bigger recirculating pump. But I don't think we're going to need anything more than this because we can only store so much water at any given time. The nice thing about these commercial units is how ridiculously long-lasting the membranes are if you take good care of them. While a typical hobbyist's RO membrane should be replaced every 6 to 12 months, these giant membranes can last up to 10 years. So at the greenhouse, I used a 1,000 gallon per day membrane, and I did change it once, ever, out of a feeling of obligation after about 7 years. And when I took out the old membrane, it looked brand new. So I totally believe I can get 10 years out of these new membranes. The last thing that I'll mention about this RO unit is that there's a recirculation valve to send wastewater back through the unit to make essentially less wastewater. I've seen in some home aquarium setups that they daisy chain multiple RO units with the booster pump to utilize wastewater over and over and over again. This is a similar concept. This RO, however, runs at around 180 PSI so it can handle a lot of wastewater recirculation. So at the end of all of this, we expect about a one-to-one -one purified water to wastewater ratio. From here, the wastewater goes outside to water the lawn, and the clean water goes to the 1,000 gallon freshwater holding tank. We've got one freshwater tank and one saltwater tank. Each is 1,000 gallons, and both are heated to 77 degrees by the boiler system upstairs. From these tanks, there are two variable speed drives that provide on-demand fresh and salt water to every sump in both this building and the greenhouse next door. This should make maintenance a lot easier. Let's talk about the stands. These stands are aluminum T-slot stands made by 8020. They have their pros and cons, but overall I'm really happy with them. For the pros, I like how sleek and professional they look. I've only ever had wood stands and our cinder block construction in the greenhouse. Given the choice, I would 100 out of 100 times go with this aluminum stand over those two options. I think aluminum will hold up better over time as well. Besides appearance, the whole system is an erector set, so there's the possibility of changing stuff around in the future or adding stuff like shelves. Depending on the design of the stand, it may be really challenging and might involve disassembling a lot of pieces, but it can be done if you really wanted to. As for cons, the obvious one that can't be ignored is that they're expensive. Everything is custom cut and designed for your specific project. So there is that markup reflected in the price. Also, the material itself is considerably more expensive than wood. So if you decide to go this route, expect to pay for it. The other con is that it's just not at all fun to work with. And it took a fair bit of trial and error to get familiar with it. There are no instructions whatsoever. There's a drawing of what the stand is supposed to look like, but it's just a picture. Nothing is labeled, there's no measurements, which often leads to the wrong piece being used because it turns out that that pile of extrusions over there, yeah, some of them are one inch longer than the others and you need to grab the right ones. Screws? There's a few different types, several hundred of each, and hopefully you use the right ones in the right places because there is exactly the number that you need, not one screw extra. So it's kind of horrifying to build a couple of stands 
and then realize that the numbers aren't looking right and you have to take it all apart because you used the wrong screws. Once we could actually see a built stand in front of us, we could more easily go through and figure out with a calculator how many screws of a certain type that there should be and then match it up with the bags to confirm everything. Once we did that, we figured out a lot. But we had all these washers and screws that just didn't have a home. Hundreds of them. Again, to our horror, we discovered that some of these pieces come with default hardware that we were supposed to replace with this other hardware because it was stainless while the original hardware was another kind of steel. Now we get to add on about three days to disassemble and reassemble the stands previously constructed to now use the correctly swapped out hardware. Did I mention that there's no instructions? It's a pain in the butt. Still, we eventually got good at it. So moving forward, I feel like I have a really good understanding of how to build these damn things. One other thing that I'll mention about these stands is that I made a last minute modification to them. Originally, they were designed to sit flat on the ground with the frame resting on the floor. The more I thought about it, the more I came to the inevitable truth that I needed leveling feet and leveling casters. So there's three main reasons for this. The first is obviously the ability to move the stands. Being able to easily move them from the front of the building to its final position at the back is huge. I'm never going to move these tanks with water in it, but just being able to move the tanks from the loading area to the back of the building reduced my anxiety about the move-in day substantially. All I have to worry about now is getting it from the truck to the stand right at the door. The added mobility of the stands also allowed us to brainstorm other tank layouts. We spent an afternoon moving them around into different configurations, and after all that, we ended up going back to the original plan. Now, it was nice to be able to move the stands around and walk around the space just to do that mental exercise. And the best part is, is that it confirmed that the original layout was indeed the best layout. The second reason is we plan on running the drainage from the tanks to the sumps using a single four inch drain that the overflow boxes will connect down into. I want this pipe to sit directly on the floor because occasionally that four inch pipe will cross a walkway. So we'll have to build some sort of small step over it. It's not a big deal. The problem with the original design of the stands is because the frame is sitting on the floor. That four inch pipe now has to sit on top of that. So what was originally a four inch step is now gonna be closer to an eight inch step in many cases. So once we added the wheels, the frame sits six inches off the ground, allowing space for that four inch drain line to sit directly on the ground. The third and last reason is to be able to easily level the stands. This concrete floor is supposed to be dead level, but there's really no way that it's gonna be perfectly level. So each stand rests on six leveling casters that can each handle 2,200 pounds. In addition, there are four feet that can each handle 2,000 pounds. Being able to level each of the 10 contact points to perfectly level the stands is such a nice luxury. Okay, that pretty much covers the major developments up to this point. As for next steps, there are some small carpentry projects that still need to be done, like putting up AZAC trim and covering the posts. Now there are some really big carpentry projects like the kitchen slash break area upstairs that I'm honestly putting no resources into right now. If you've ever done a big kitchen, you know how much money gets dumped into these projects. And right now I'm all about getting actual aquariums up and running. One day it'll be a sweet space, but no day soon. Next step number two 
we're waiting on the sumps, which are going to be something like 96 by 48 by 24, which doesn't seem that big when I measure it out on the floor. But when I visited Ryan's tank down in Dallas, he had a sump that was slightly smaller, and it looked absolutely gigantic standing next to it. So it's not super critical that we get the sumps right away, but it will be cool just to get one into the space to see what it looks like. Finally, we're waiting on the tanks themselves. I was hoping that they would be here by now, but Felix at Reef Savvy moved his workshop, so that pushes back our timetable even further. If you thought these tanks were going to show up on time, you haven't been paying attention to this whole building project. Everything gets delayed. It's a blessing in disguise though, because it lets me knock out some of these other bills as they come up and generate some funds to actually pay for the tanks with a little bit more breathing room. Anyhow, this is the last update I'm planning on doing before the tanks are here and full of water. Thank you all so much for your interest in this series. It's been a really long ride getting to this point, so I appreciate all the excitement over this project, even without a single reef aquarium involved. Believe me, there's nobody on earth that wants to get these tanks in than me, but we all have to wait a little bit longer. Now that we're building the stands, it's getting easier and easier to envision how the space will be utilized. It's exciting stuff. Okay guys, please feel free to share your comments below, and don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell to stay up to date on this build. As always, please leave a like on your way out, and I'll see you all next video. Happy reefing.